Hello, I'm Katie Normington, Vice-Chancellor of De Montfort University, Leicester. And welcome to this special event, which we're hosting in collaboration with United Nations Peacekeeping and the United Nations Academic Impact Initiative. As many of you know, DMU takes marking the International Days of the United Nations very seriously. In fact, events held by staff and students during the past 12 months have now drawn a collective audience of more than 4,000 people, either live at events or viewing their recordings by video in our archives. Today's event, Leveraging the Power of Youth for Peace and Security, on the International Day of UN Peacekeepers, has a very special meaning to us here at DMU. We were delighted that the United Nations Academic Impact Initiative gave us the responsibility of organising a programme with UN Peacekeeping, the Department of the United Nations, which plays such a significant global role in helping countries navigate the difficult path from conflict to peace. The honour is a reflection of the faith the United Nations Academic Impact Initiative has placed in its Global Hub for Sustainability Development Goal 16, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions, based here at DMU. And DMU is proud to be the only academic impact hub for sustainable development Goal 16 in the world and the only UNAI SDG academic impact, impact hub in the United Kingdom. Today, I can exclusively announce that De Montfort University has been awarded the honour of a second term as UNAI Global Hub for SDG 16, allowing us to continue our research, scholarship and innovation in pursuit of working towards the targets and indicators of SDG 16 and all 17 global goals for at least three more years. We will keep everyone updated on our progress and how you can engage with the Hub's activities here at DMU in due course. But today is about celebrating the International Day of UN Peacekeepers. UN Peacekeepers are often overlooked as the unsung heroes they truly are. They provide paths to peace in the most complex of environments, using unique strengths of diplomacy, legitimacy, burden sharing, and the ability to deploy troops and police to work alongside civilian peacekeepers to address a range of mandates set by the UN Security Council and General Assembly. But you don't have to take my word for it because today we have a remarkable line of guest speakers, including representatives of the UK mission who sit on the uh, UN Security Council and alumni who served as a UN peacekeeper two academics with expertise in the field of peacekeeping research and a serving British soldier on UN peacekeeping duty in Mali. I'd like to, wel to welcome you and our very special guests to today's events. Please leave questions for our speakers in the chat and uh, they'll be asked during the question and answer session. And I'd now like to introduce today's chair for the session, Dr. Simon Aldroyd our Pro Vice-Chancellor for the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Thank you for a warm welcome. And uh, it's lovely to be here this afternoon to be able to chair such a, 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 an interesting and, and rich session um, with such a, a diverse uh, number of, of, of contributors. So um, as, as Katie's outlined, um, we, we are going to go through the event, we'll go, to go, go through the event with a, a series of a five or ten minute pieces by our, our contributors and, and at the end there'll be a question and answer session with one of our serving UN peacekeepers so please do I, I would like to encourage you to put those questions in the chat on the right hand side um, that we can then uh, use and, and, and put to, uh, to our guests. Um, okay um, let's move on then it's my real pleasure to um, introduce our, our, first, our first guest um, Colonel Oliver Nerton. And Colonel Nerton is Senior Military Advisor to the UK Mission to the UN. And within that role, oversees UK deployments and military advice, and is able to give really a unique perspective on the role of UN peacekeeping. So over to uh, Colonel Nerton. Simon, uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, DMU, and, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, great to be with you here early in New York uh, on this Friday morning. 
Um, what I'm going to do, I've got 10 minutes, uh, and I'm going to cover uh, four particular areas that I think um, you know might be of interest to you, and then Phelan, my uh, counterpart here in New York, will, will follow and give another side of the, the perspective. As you can see from the address, uh, I'm in the military. Um, and a bit about my background, um, very quickly, I've done tours in uh, Cyprus and in Bosnia during the 1990s. Um, I've done all the normal bits of, that you would expect from a serving officer on the modern era. I've been in Iraq, Afghanistan, served in places like Pakistan, uh, and worked in London in Whitehall doing things on the international relations scene. Uh, I did my international relations masters at King's College London uh, during my time in the military uh, a few years ago. Uh, and looked at South Asia, where I've got a particular interest. Um, then I've come here, and I'm here for three years. And so my role here in New York falls into three main areas. First and foremost, I provide military advice uh, to the permanent representative, the ambassador at the United Nations. Um, and if you can imagine um, a, a hub and spoke of a wheel, uh, in the middle, you've got the UN Secretariat, the building that you see on the East River. That is, if you like, the headquarters of the United Nations. And running out from that are the 193 spokes that are the uh, various um, nation state uh, missions, one of which is the, the United Kingdom. And within that, we provide a, a military advisor. Uh, I have a small team uh, to give advice on. on uh, any number of issues, any number of cross-cutting issues, not just peacekeeping, but any military issue that's dealt with at any time of the day. Um, and there are about 150 military advisors, but there are only five, uh, permanent five uh, mission advisors, which are, uh, of course, from, from the UN Security Council. And so alongside the US, France, uh, Russia, and China, uh, the UK um, it has a very special role and a very important role. Um, and that's, you know, sort of something that, that endures. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, the second uh, role I have is to manage the UK commitment to UN peacekeeping worldwide. And that numbers about 600 soldiers who are normal, regular soldiers uh, deployed from their normal uh, duties into peacekeeping roles for a period of time and they train up to do that role. Uh, you'll hear from one of them later uh, and during that time they are working for the United Nations uh, wearing the blue beret and operating in peacekeeping missions uh, around the world. Again I'll talk more about that. So we've got about 600. They're split mainly between two two main missions. We've had a commitment in Cyprus uh, called UNFASIP um, uh, for sort of 40, 50 years now. And um, in fact, I went there at age six uh, when my father, a, a peacekeeper in the mid 1970s, I then served there myself as a young officer in my 20s in, in, in the mid 1990s. Um, and so I've sort of come full, full circle. Um, and that has endured for that period of time. So a bit more about missions and how they endure or don't uh, in a moment. And the second one, which you've probably heard more of more recently, which is our recent deployment to Mali, which began earlier this year. Um, again, it's about 250 to 300 people committed to this uh, mission uh, in the sort of central Western areas of, of Africa in a very challenging environment, um, which demands a lot of our our soldiers and why we're very well suited to it because of the levels of training that we undertake. Uh, more of that later. We've also got individual staff officers deployed in U UN missions across Africa um, and, and the Middle East uh, from places like uh, Libya, Somalia, South Sudan, even as far south as the Congo, uh, where they were battling with uh, a volcano last week, which you might have seen in the news. So lots and lots going on and that feeds me back in new york the information i need to understand to help phelan who you will hear from in a moment 
uh, when it comes to devising things like the mandate and the mandate is the mission uh, given to um, uh, the, the, the UN peacekeepers in Mali to undertake its, if you like, the higher level order of what uh, the UN would like and what we as member states would like uh, the UN mission in Mali to undertake. The third part of my role here is to look at, um, is to sit on the military staff committee. Now, this is an interesting uh, committee. It sits every two weeks. It was defined by the UN Charter. It's been around since February 1946, when, of course, at the end of the Second World War, the main threat to world peace was the thought of another war. So it had a huge military um, uh, role in it. And we meet and have met every two weeks for 75 years. Uh, and in the military, we like traditions like that. So that's what we do. And uh, along with my P5 counterparts that I mentioned earlier, we have an elected 10 who come on to the Security Council every, for, for two years. Uh, and so there are 10 other nations representing other parts of the world that come in. And collectively, as 15, we discuss the military challenges um, of the day. And we get briefed every two weeks. And I will leave this to go to, to the meeting to talk about um, the, a particular mission where we'll get briefed by the, the mission in detail about progress and what they're up to. So that's what we do there. We also look at some of the other cross-cutting issues uh, and issues that are out there now that the UN need to get involved in and tackle. And that will be including things like peacekeeping reform, but it could also be how to um, support and promote women, peacekeeping, uh, gender, those sorts of issues. So lots of really um, interesting issues. It's not just about um, uh, military and green stuff, it, it also sort of has its tentacles far and wide. Okay, let's move on to uh, the next point. I'm also going to cover what does the UN uh, peacekeeping commissions look like and just finish with a few of the sort of modern challenges. Uh, conscious of time, I've got sort of five minutes to, to, to go. So what do, do does the, the UN peacekeeping look like? It's 13 missions currently across Africa, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, but it also stretches as far as um, India and Pakistan uh, and the Kashmir region. Um, some of these missions have been around since uh, 1948. Uh, Anto in Jerusalem uh, is the earliest, uh, but the, uh, the, 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 the constant tension between India and Pakistan uh, since 1949 has meant a small mission uh, there, just keeping an eye on on the situation. Uh, and you might think that that seems a bit odd in the modern era where two very uh, uh, developed and modern nations have still got UN peacekeepers sitting uh, just uh, on their border uh, providing oversight. But these are some of the challenges of UN, of UN and the UN peacekeeping system. And then more recently, the latest uh, mission uh, was about seven years ago in the Central African Republic, a very troubled area. Uh, I visited there about 18 months ago, and it really is got some huge problems. Um, and uh, the UN are there to, to create the space. The peacekeepers are there to create the space for the politicians to find a solution. We're not there to force peace. We're there to create a situation which allows uh, a political solution to be found. And that's very important and uh, why we must remember it. It costs about six and a half billion dollars a year to run all these missions. And that covers about uh, the best part of 100,000 peacekeepers. That's military and police. So we, when we talk about peacekeeping, we're not just talking about military. A lot of the missions are very heavy numbers of police. And these peacekeepers are drawn from all the, all the 193, well, not all 193 states, but uh, many states in the UN who wish to commit manpower or equipment to, to the UN. Um, so we have about 13 existing missions. Some have, have closed down. Most recently, the mission in Liberia uh, closed down a couple of years ago. Uh, but what we haven't seen are any new missions in the last seven years. And there are reasons for that, and perhaps that'll come up during the course of the, of the next hour. 
Uh, but six and a half billion is actually pretty good value. I mean, it represents less than half half of one percent of the world's military expenditure. So when you look at it in that respect, it's quite good value. Um, and of course, we all pay. So in many respects, there's a tension here where we're trying to keep the costs as low as possible, recognizing that we've got a hell of a lot to do to try and bring about some some uh, some peace in areas where there are some fairly difficult answers. Finally, then, modern challenges. <clears throat> what are they? Well, I've alluded to some of them. Um, when you've got 193 states, uh, albeit there are only certain numbers in the Security Council that, that, that have the weight, if you're going to have consensus of 193, it, it's going to prove to be quite challenging one way or another. It, everyone has a, uh, a view. And of course, that is positive. We're getting consensus. But to achieve consensus, you sometimes have to le lower your level of ambition. And that's you know as as, value, as 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 relevant when you're talking about E5 and think about what is happening today out there in, in the world, views between Russia and China and the US and the UK and France are, are, are different. And everybody has national ambition. So trying to get consensus means that you have to lower that level of ambition. But it has been around for 75 years, and that is something that we must celebrate. Uh, at the end of the day, we've got people at the table. And if you don't have people at the table, then people act independently, and we don't have an environment in which people can communicate. Uh, areas of reform are particularly important. The cost of, of funding uh, UN peacekeeping the size of UN peacekeeping. What we really need now on the modern peacekeeping uh, environment it are, are less people, more mobile people with greater levels of technology. And of course, that's only accessible to certain countries. When you're talking about some of the developing countries in Africa who are absolutely vital to UN peacekeeping, they don't have the levels of technology. They're still working with the equipment that we in the UK are using back in the 70s and 80s, and maybe even before that. And they work on large numbers of people uh, doing uh, fairly uh, routine procedures where we want smaller numbers that can move to where the issues are. You've got to remember some of these countries are enormous that we're working in, and we simply don't have the footprint to cover all of it all of the time. So. Uh, what would I say to you at this stage in your 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 lives, looking looking forward, and perhaps looking into the international community, uh, and perhaps ending up maybe at the United Nations one day? Um, I would say that uh, one thing that's taught me here is to get perspectives, to get the perspectives of the other side, and to understand the issues that uh, are out there. It's very easy in the West to have a view about how we're going to bring peace to your country. But there are very many other factors that through 25 years in the military that I've learned that when you sit down with somebody uh, and understand their perspective, uh, you can really help bring about a solution that is a collective solution, not just your solution. Um, the difficulty of consensus uh, is, is one that will trouble the UN and one that we continually grapple with. Uh, but getting the next generation, getting new guys involved in that uh, discussion is is the most valuable <clears throat> thing that we can do because, um, you know, these issues are not going to go away. This is going to continue for many years yet. Um, and, and some of the challenges that we have now will endure uh, through my lifetime and, and be, be things that uh, dominate what happens in areas of Africa and in the Middle East. Uh, through yours as well. So um, great to be here. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, if there are any questions, throw them down in the chat and we'll see if we can deal with them in the time uh, remaining at the end. But uh, great to be here and uh, best of luck. Thank you. Oliver, thank you. That was fantastic. Th pass on my thanks uh, on behalf of the university. Um, a, a really unique insight into the military UN liaison and, and some of the detail of the activity of the, of the 13 missions and, and particularly I guess um, about that tension between national ambition and, and how you achieve consensus so so thank you very much uh, moving on now to our, our second uh, speaker our second speaker is uh, Fallon 
Brady. And uh, Phelan is a uh, UK mission to the United Nations lead on peacekeeping reform and has the responsibility for a number of individual peacekeeping missions, some of those that we heard about from Oliver, in the Security Council. So I'd like to hand over now to Phelan. Thank you very much, Simon, and good afternoon to everyone watching. I'm really pleased to be here today uh, to speak on such an eminent panel uh, of academics and particularly serving and former UN peacekeepers, uh, and especially glad to be doing so to help mark the International Day of UN Peacekeepers and to pay tribute to the courage and dedication of the women and men who serve on behalf of the UN uh, in some of the world's toughest environments, made only tougher in the last year by the COVID-19 pandemic. As you've heard, I, I work alongside Colonel Merton at the UK Mission to the UN in New York. My home department is the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and I work on the civilian side of our mission uh, in the political section, which focuses on representing the UK in the Security Council. I work on three peacekeeping missions in particular. Those are MINUSCA in the Central African Republic, MINUSMA in Mali, and UNFASIP in Cyprus. And as you've heard, I also work on the issue of peacekeeping reform more generally. So I've been asked to talk to you today about the perspective of the UK and the Security Council and what it's like uh, to really negotiate on peacekeeping. I'll start by setting out three overall goals uh, to what the UK does at the UN. These are firstly, working with other countries to use all of the UN's tools uh, to help reduce and prevent conflict and to respond to humanitarian emergencies and, provo and promote sustainable development. Secondly, we stand up for our values and interests, including promoting human rights, the inclusion of women, youth and civil society and tackling climate change. Finally, we try to contribute towards making the UN as effective as it can be so that it delivers for the people around the world in the perilous situations who need it most. Peacekeeping missions are, of course, one of the UN's most tangible uh, and recognisable achievements. And it's an area where all three of these priorities come together. Uh, as, as you've already heard, each peacekeeping mission is different. But many of them have at their core uh, what's called a protection of civilians mandate. That's using uniformed personnel to intervene if necessary, or perhaps a mandate to monitor and report back on a ceasefire uh, or help secure elections uh, or to build up the capacities of national security institutions. As well as uniformed parts of a mission, there will usually be civilian staff as well. They may be tasked with supporting the parties to a peace agreement with the implementation of that deal, perhaps to mediate on a way forward in a peace process and with promoting reporting on human rights and helping to establish institutions and justice. In the last year, of course, missions have also had to deal with the impact of COVID-19 and have been encouraged to help authorities with their responses where they can, and also to ensure they've got the right protocols in place to limit the risks of spreading the virus. So what does this look like in practice in the day-to-day -day work of the Security Council? Well, as you've heard from Colonel Ollie, all peacekeeping missions have what is referred to as a mandate from the Security Council. This is essentially the piece of paper in a legally binding resolution that authorizes them to be established and to deploy troops, police and civilian personnel, and if necessary to use force to, def to defend themselves or to defend the mandate they are given. The 15 members of the council have to come together to determine when to establish a mission and what its mandate should be. Uh, and in many cases, we have to renew that mandate each year and update it where necessary. Um, then once these mandates are agreed by uh, the council, it's over to the whole UN membership to agree to how, how to pay for them in the General Assembly. So how does the council go about agreeing these mandates? Well, there's an informal system known as the penholder system, where one council member takes it upon themselves to initiate the first draft of a council resolution. Uh, the UK, for instance, is penholder on several issues, including Cyprus, Sudan and Somalia. This means um, it would be up to us to consult with the UN, the mission and the country hosting that mission, and on that basis to put forward a first draft. We would then convene negotiations between all 15 council members. Um, and over the last year, just to say, we've all had to get used to doing this, uh, doing this much of this work virtually as a result of the pandemic. And while this can't replace in-person negotiations, uh, I think we've definitely managed to make it work. So then we all meet at working level uh, in relatively informal discussions and seek what is known as instructions from our home capitals, telling us what our governments want to influence in a mandate. The pen holder then revises their draft resolution in response to feedback, and we engage in a couple of rounds of further discussions uh, over the next few weeks. Then after a while, it usually becomes clear where the votes are going to fall, 
And if a country thinks that their resolution is likely to get at least nine positive votes and crucially no veto from a permanent member of the council, they'll put it to the vote. Now, much as Colonel Oli outlined before me, forging consensus on these mandates among a wide range um, of members can be challenging. We may all agree that something should be done, but not necessarily on what or how it should be done. In many cases, the resolutions the council adopts on peacekeeping are voted on unanimously, but what that can perhaps mask uh, is mask over is some of the tough compromises that had to be made to get there. Um, and this often means settling for less than we might have wanted, than anyone might have wanted going into a negotiation. But ultimately, you know, the UN is an organization composed of and limited by uh, the ambitions of its member states. Uh, and so this is the price for getting consensus and being able to move forward. Now, mandates will often run to many pages uh, and can contain a real mix of different topics. Um, there are the nuts and bolts required to set up a peacekeeping mission and give it uh, its tasks. There are messages to governments and warring parties to encourage them to make progress towards stability and reconciliation, uh, possibly with the threat of sanctions to those who spoil the peace. For the UK, as Colonel Olly referred to, it's also very important to ensure that these mandates, and indeed in other Security Council resolutions, that we reflect our cross-cutting priorities, such as peacekeeping reform, protection of human rights, the inclusion of women in peace processes and in peacekeeping missions, tackling sexual exploitation and abuse in the UN system, and finally, and most significantly, given the topic of this year's International Day, the inclusion of young people in helping to build peace. Unfortunately, not all council members agree with us on these priorities, and we often face an uphill battle against some countries who argue that these issues are not irrelevant, or who argue that they are somehow encroaching on the sovereignty of the countries the missions are deployed in. Now, given the focus this year on youth, peace and security, I want to touch on this agenda and how we approach it at the UK mission. Um, the UK and the UN champions the youth, peace and security agenda, and we believe firmly in the importance of giving young people a voice on the international stage and a voice in national peace building efforts. Peacekeeping missions have an important role to play here in amplifying the voices of young people and promoting their involvement in national and local peace processes. With more than half the world's population uh, below the age of 30, it means young people are key stakeholders in any society, and we need to get this right. At the UK mission, we play our part by, advoca by advocating consistently for the inclusion of youth in Security Council resolutions and in bringing young voices to the council itself. For instance, in February of this year, the UK held the rotating presidency of the Security Council, and it was up to us to decide who to invite to come and speak at the council's meetings. We made it a priority to include the voices of young people, especially young women and civil society representatives. It was one of my proudest moments in this job so far to be able to invite a youth representative from the Central African Republic to address the council. She was able to share her first-hand experiences and to speak uh, so powerfully about her hopes and her fears for the future of her country. On that note, the final thing I would add uh, is an encouragement to all of you watching and especially young people and students to get involved and to make your mark in building a better world. Now that might sound like a very tall order, but there are many ways to go about it. Um, whether that's through getting involved with NGOs, charities and civil society organizations, such as the United Nations Association, whether it's volunteering for or, or working for the UN one day, as you've heard, joining the armed forces and becoming a peacekeeper yourself, or if you've liked the sound of what you've heard from me today, to consider applying to the civil service and to making your mark that way. Um, I'd be very happy to answer any questions on that uh, or to discuss particular routes into the Foreign Office after the event. Thanks once again, and back to you, Simon. Um, thank you very much uh, for that. Again, a really interesting insight, particularly, I guess, into UN effectiveness, into the, um, the uniform and civilian aspects of missions. Um, and again, in, in looking at the, the negotiation and consensus piece, which I, which I think already um, two discussions in is coming out as a as a theme, um, and and then latterly the the youth peace and security agenda. So thank you, thank you again, uh, Phelan. Um Now we would like to introduce our, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard Smith from here at DMU. Um, Richard is the head of the Cybersecurity Research Group here at the university with expertise in cyber peacekeeping, an emergent field in the realm of global peacekeeping. So um, over to you, Richard. 
Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, hopefully everyone can see my slides. As was said, I'm Dr. Richard Smith from the Cyber Technology Institute here at De Montfort University. And, and this work is actually a collaboration with Dr. Michael Robinson and Professor Kevin Jones from Airbus, Professor Helga Janneke from the Cybersecurity Research Center in Australia, and Dr. Leandros Maglaras, also from the Cyber Technology Institute at DMU. Now, I'm here to talk to you about cyber peacekeeping. So I suppose the best place to start is actually, well, what is cyber peacekeeping going to look like? Because we're very pr privileged today to have uh, both current and previous peacekeepers from the, the more traditional approach. But when it comes to the cyber domain, how are we actually going to adapt? Do we try starting completely from scratch? Or instead, do we try using the existing approach and actually including the cyber elements into what is currently working? And this is the approach that we feel is certainly the best because it essentially allows countries to work with a system that they know, they understand, and they trust. You might ask, why would we need cyber peacekeepers? Well, there is some debate as to whether cyber warfare has officially happened yet. Uh, but what is beyond doubt is that we've seen a number of weaponized cyber attacks. So Stuxnet in 2010 targeted the uranium enrichment capabilities of Iran. And the black energy attacks in the Ukraine in 2015 actually led to hundreds of thousands being without power. So this is something that is becoming more and more prevalent and it's only going to keep growing, I'm afraid. Now, what we have to recognize is that cyber is a little different because the impact of new technologies takes time to be understood and we simply don't have that existing timeline for cyber. So we don't understand everything that is going on, sorry. And if we take an example of landmines, they were once considered an acceptable form of trying to limit the movement and disrupt the movement of, um, of people and armies, whereas now they're seen as indiscriminate and they are essentially banned. So we have to try and identify how this is going to translate into the cyber domain. There has been some work taking place. Um, so, for example, the, the Tallinn Manual was first published in 2013, and this offers a comprehensive analysis of how existing international laws apply to cyberspace. But there is still a significant amount of work to be done. The UN itself does actually have its digital blue helmets at the moment, and their remit is very much focused on protecting UN systems. Uh, they also do work in human trafficking and monitoring cr criminal cryptocurrency through the dark web. I'm sure they do a lot more that we're just not allowed to know about. But there is existing capability. But the question then is, how do we expand it? What we're looking at now are some of the traditional approaches. So can we interpose a buffer zone between two warring parties. Essentially, what you would do is you would have the, the peacekeepers actually doing things like dropping packets that are taking actually being used in a cyber attack or blocking the IP addresses of, of known attackers, um, removing vulnerabilities by patching systems, or providing additional hardware capabilities to reduce the impact of denial of service attacks. Perhaps the most important point here is the, the providing training for local staff, because as uh, Oliver has pointed out, it costs a lot of money to actually um, and to, to have peacekeepers in the field. It's a significant undertaking. It's not something that can go on indefinitely. And so actually what we need to do is think about how we can train up a local capability to take over when the peacekeepers leave. 
We can also look at disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. So again, it's a parallel from the physical, but it's in some ways very different. So disarming software is incredibly difficult because it's very easy to hide simply on removable media or by changing very small parts. If we were to look at hardware disarmament, most cyber attacks use standard equipment like PCs. So it's not realistic for us to be able to completely remove all computers from um, any country. And because computers are so ubiquitous to modern life, it simply isn't going to be feasible without significant impact upon the public. So perhaps the best option is viability disarmament. So here we look at cyber weapons and the vulnerabilities that they exploit. By actually um, protecting agreed systems and patching to remove those vulnerabilities, the cyber weapons may still exist, but their impact has been reduced or entirely removed. So it's something that we can do to show a real difference. If we look at expanding the remit, um, we can also look at electoral assistance. So that might be in either protecting or verifying the um, accuracy of electronic voting devices, or if we look back at the US elections in 2016, it might actually be protecting the servers of political parties to ensure that emails aren't leaked and disrupt the elections themselves. We can also draw parallels to mine clearance. So essentially here, malware is incredibly similar in the way it works to mines because often it's seemingly benign and hidden until something happens to trigger it and it can cause significant damage. Here the idea is to actually identify, mitigate and remove malware in the first instance but then to build up a capability to be able to remove it in the future and to get to achieve agreements so that malware will be removed when peace is actually achieved. So just to come to some conclusions, um, cyber warfare is a growing issue. Um, it's going to get bigger. We're seeing an, lots of attacks, um, both deliberate and sometimes accidental. Um, there is a lot of work currently ongoing in the area of cyber peacekeeping. And there are a number of equivalences between physical and potential cyber peacekeeping efforts. But there are still challenges, one of which is staffing. There is a global shortage of cybersecurity professionals. And this is where young people really do come in. Because if we can train more professionals to do this, then we will have a greater pool and a greater ability to actually put some sort of cyber peacekeeping into practice in the future. Another main issue is that of attribution, knowing and understanding where cyber attacks are actually coming from. Again, this is something where research is ongoing and it's a field that really does need significant support. I think my final point is to point out that no matter what we are proposing, any solution that we come up with is built upon trust. Because essentially, if you're going to deploy cyber peacekeepers, they will then have access and perhaps control of significant elements of national infrastructure. Without that underlying level of trust, it simply cannot work. So thank you very much for your attention. Obviously, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions in the Q&A session. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you for, for the contribution. Again, a, a really interesting insight into, I guess, 21st century peacekeeping, the impact of new technologies, international law, uh, electoral assistance, as you outlined, and, and I, I love the concept of, of the digital blue helmets. Um, 
Okay, uh, on to our next speaker then, uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, and welcome uh, Professor Julia Shaw. Uh, Julia is Professor of Law and Social Justice and Director of the Centre for Law, Justice and Society here at DMU, and will give us an insight into how our students, how DMU students can apply their learning and apply their research uh, towards supporting UN peacekeeping. So over to Julia. Thank you, Simon. And thank you also to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Katie Normington, for sharing the wonderful news that we've been chosen for a second term as the Global Academic Hub for SD, SDG 16, the promotion of peace, justice and strong institutions. This is, this is marvellous. Um, we're also delighted to participate in, in marking the International Day of UN Peacekeepers. Um, and in the School of Law, this important theme runs throughout our teaching activities and it's further developed through our research centre, the Centre for Law, Justice and Society. So what I, I thought I would do for five minutes is just give you a snapshot of what we do. So could you show the first slide, please? <clears throat> OK, so in terms of the undergraduate programme, the School of Law offers an inter interdisciplinary suite of modules which relate to a variety of conflict and peacekeeping related issues and also some of the legal complexities that, re that are related to specific cases. Uh, our core modules of international law, international child law and human rights law all provide students with a comprehensive insight into, for example, the global infrastructure of international humanitarian law with the addition of a peacekeeping specialisation. Our students are also provided with insights into United Nations peacekeeping undertakings such as the role and powers of the UN Security Council, the UN Security Council Resolution Interpretation, UN Peace Operations Doctrine, the Rule of Law, and also conflict resolution frameworks. Um, I've got a couple of specific examples. One of these um, is, uh, is elaborated on by one of our senior lecturers, Dr. Laura Enontron, in our core international law module. She's, she covers the right to self-determination and its two dimensions, the internal and external self-determination. The latter comes into conflict with one of the key purposes of the UN, which is to maintain international peace and security as enshrined in Article 1 of the UN Charter. And along with other implications, our students discuss and debate on how external self-determination can be reconciled with international peace and security. Uh, due to the elaboration of a range of topics and themes in this area, our taught undergraduate programmes prepare our graduates for a future career in the fields of international peace operations, with international organisations, also work with NGOs and, of course, individual advocates. And due to the elaboration of a range of topics and themes in this area, our taught undergraduate programmes, um, you know, we, we are also supplemented by a suite of master's programmes. Uh, for example, our, our LLM Masters in Law uh, we develop a selection of case studies which explore some of the legal and to a lesser extent, extent institutional issues which relate to the conduct of UN peace operations as broadly defined. We also offer supervision in the field of peacekeeping on our PhD and doctoral programme and this is publicised on our research centre website. Second slide please. Um, one, such, one such example from the research and our teaching side is Dr. Conrad Nayam Chata. Conrad was one of our PhD students and he's now the head of our doctoral program, our research students program. Now he, uh, his original PhD thesis was on international law and child soldiers, but since being awarded his PhD with us, he's published this research in several leading academic journals. This includes a co-authored book, now in its fourth edition from the end of last year called International Child Law, published by Routledge. The broader remit of Conrad's research on children and armed conflict fits closely with today's theme of the road to a lasting peace, leveraging the power of youth for peace and security. And this is especially pertinent as thousands of children are recruited by state armies, non-state and terrorist groups, all of which is in breach of international law. So peacekeeping operations are vital in providing protection and signalling violence against children to the child protection organisations and of course in helping to identify and release children from state and non-state armed groups. As Dr Naya Mutata articulates in his published research, it's also essential for sustainable peace 
to not only rehabilitate and reintegrate former child soldiers through the disarmament, demobilization, reintegration programs, but also to engage them in post-conflict peace building and reconstruction processes. Another example we have is, uh, is Dr. Uh, Laura Inontrong, who I mentioned uh, previously, who does a lot of teaching in this area on, um, on our undergraduate program. She was recently awarded a major British Academy grant last year on reconstructing judicial institutions for conflict transformation. Now, this important research seeks to assess the common law division of the Supreme Court of Cameroon as an institution established to transform the system structure and relationships that triggered violent minority conflict in Cameroon. Now, this important project has the immediate and long term goals of fostering peaceful coexistence between the English speaking minority and the French speaking majority populations in Cameroon. My final example is Dr. Serena Landerfeld. Now, Dr. Landerfeld joined us last year in the School of Law. She completed her PhD on the changing conceptualization of individuals throughout the development of international humanitarian law. Uh, Serena is currently working on publishing her doctoral thesis as a book, and this important work contributes to a more critical and nuanced understanding of the distinction between combatants and civilians in armed conflict. So by disentangling the conceptual underpinnings of the civilian status under the law, Dr. Landerfeld's research provides important insights for the UN peacekeeping mandate, specifically for the protection of civilians. Um, end slide, please. <clears throat> um, yes, yeah, so I'd finally like to, to say um, the UN Peacekeeping Initiative it represents obviously the, the most significant collective investment in global peace, security and stability and it's a privilege for our university to be involved in marking this special day. So thank you very much. Julia, thank you. Um, a, a, a real a interesting look at peacekeeping through the lens of the law and, and particularly I guess how we here at the university um, are linking the SDGs into our teaching and into our research and then latterly um, from Julia there some um, case studies which which um, which really bring it to life. Um, I think now we are ready to move on to um, uh, to speak and to introduce uh, our uh, current serving UN peacekeeper. So um, we have a, 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 it's great to be able to welcome Captain Lizzie Millwater, who is a British soldier currently serving as a UN peacekeeper in Mali. Um, and uh, Captain Millwater is supporting the transitional authorities to ensure security, stabilization, and protection of civilians, as we've, as we've heard, and also supporting national political dialogue and reconciliation. Uh, and it's wonderful to be able to, uh, to, to welcome you uh, this afternoon, Lizzie. Um, over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so as you've heard, um, I'm currently part of the Long Range Reconnaissance Group, which is a UK contingent to MINUSMA, the UN uh, peacekeeping mission in Mali. The MINUSMA mandate is to implement the peace accord and also to protect civilians, largely in the centre of Mali, but also actually wider um, across the country, because this is an issue that's not just happening um, with the ethnic tensions in the centre. So our role as a reconnaissance task group is to patrol into the more remote areas of Mali. Um, and these are areas that the UN has not had a persistent presence in. And we're doing that to enhance the mission's situational awareness um, and so that then they can respond to local communities' concerns and help the Malian authorities implement the peace accord. Now, this capability is a capability that was identified by MINUSMA as a capability that they required and they had a critical capability gap. So when the UK were looking at supporting another UN peacekeeping operation as part of peacekeeping reform, one of the things that we're looking at is ensuring that actually the contributions from troop contributing countries are contributions that are really required by the mission. And so this was one of the examples that we are leading on peacekeeping re reform by sending a capability that the mission had exclusively stated they required. So as a task group, we are based in the northeast of Mali in Gao. 
and we're part of the Maywell Task Force construct. Now, as you heard earlier from Colonel Norton, the UK and also the UN are looking at ensuring that uh, troops that deploy on UN peacekeeping missions are more mobile and able to get to areas that are required. A small footprint, but more adaptable. And that is what this construct is aiming to do. It's a relatively new construct. It was identified as a requirement around about a year, 18 months ago, and it's been established since March. And it's created to enable the mission to better respond to threats against civilians and against the local population and to support really that protection of civilians mandate. During oh, being part of this Maywell Task Force then has seen us conduct patrols of up to 28 days, both to the southeast and southwest of Gao, and to enhance Mali and security forces um, security efforts. Now, my role within the contingent then is I'm the human security advisor um, and I'm also the CIMIC lead for our contingent. And in this role, I largely work closely with the civilian element of the mission to understand their information requirements, information gaps, their current and future stabilization projects and any protection of civilian issues that are happening in the areas in which we're operating. This then shapes our patrols and helps us identify where our presence is most required and for how long, what duration. It also allows us to support the civilian uh, pillar field missions, i.e. providing that security so that they can get out to areas that they couldn't normally get to, um, to engage with local populations and deliver those stabilisation activities and projects. And these might be community violence reduction projects, um, it might be conducting investigations into human rights abuses or violations, or it could be something like support to the justice and corrections taskings, such as conducting a mobile, uh, mobile court or um, visiting and monitoring the conditions of prisons within the Gao region. Now, Melisma is an integrated mission, and so it's critical that we actually adopt an integrated approach and support the civilian pillar. If we don't do this, as peacekeepers or wrong, as military peacekeepers, we can definitely provide an element of security, but because we aren't in a persistent, we aren't persistently in that place, this security presence or the security that we provide is not an enduring um, element of security. And this is why we need to have an integrated approach, but also why we need to work with the Malian armed forces. The integrated approach by enabling the civilian pillar to get to these areas and therefore identify um, issues and also solve these issues through long-term stabilization projects allows us to have a long-term solution uh, to the issues that are driving the conflict in Mali. We have also then during our mission um, been, survived, been supporting the early warning rapid response mechanism. This was identified by the UN Security Council as a key issue that MINUSMA had over the last couple of years. The mission has really struggled to ensure that they um, really support that protection of civilians mandates because the cases have been increasing and, and violence has been spreading. So the early warning rapid response mechanism was implemented at the end of last year and it's a process which involves the whole mission and therefore, if anyone within the mission, both military patrols or uh, the civilian elements through their networks and their connections with the local population, identify an immediate threat to the local communities, immediate physical threat to local communities, then the early warning rapid response mechanism is implemented. And during our patrols over the last couple of months, we have supported the first two early warning rapid response mechanisms within Gao region. Uh, the first we supported uh, was during market days. Um, what we found were that bandits were targeting uh, local populations and basically conducting illegal tax protection in the guise of Zakat. What that meant is then um, if the villagers couldn't pay, then they would beat the local population or take their um, their cattle or some other form of payment. And this was a repetitive uh, process. And during our patrols, we found out that actually 
the bandits had visited a community within the last couple of days and had told them that they would be back um, a couple of days later in order to collect this illegal tax. Um, so we flagged this up to the community, uh, wrong, to the civilian pillar. And after discussing it, uh, they asked us to be in the area in order to deter that tax collection and to uh, protect that community. Now, this is kind of a mild example of protection of civilians, because obviously in Mali, there are also issues where they are having uh, massive inter-ethnic conflict um, and also uh, village attacks. And so rather than this being kind of the key problem within, uh, within the area that we were operating in, it was um, allowing us to protect civilians and also demonstrate how this uh, protection of civilians early warning rapid response mechanism would work so that moving forwards um, everyone was aware of the processes that they needed to conduct so that within Gao region we were all ready and able to protect civilians if, as more and more incidents came to light. Um, I would just like to finish off by saying uh, that all UN missions are different as you've already heard um, and so the, the mission in Mali may have some similar characteristics to other peacekeeping missions, uh, particularly other peacekeeping missions across um, Africa, as we found that a number of the processes implemented in Mali have also been uh, implemented elsewhere as best practice. Um, but what I, I guess what I would like to kind of leave on is by saying that um, UN peacekeeping missions help make a real difference to local communities, whether they're big or small, and really are there to help uh, provide that security longer term. And if anyone within the audience is considering working with the UN or think about how they can make a difference in these in these conflicts, and I'd really advise them to um, think about where where they could contribute, be that through um, joining the military and doing it as a military peacekeeper or looking at uh, UN careers, um, such as being a UN volunteer, which then allows them to uh, work in UN peacekeeping missions and gain that experience for a future career within the UN. Lizzie, thank you very much. And, and it's been really interesting to hear about your mission capability. It was interesting to hear from Colonel Nerton earlier around the political strategy and then hearing from you on, really about the on the ground activity and the, um, you know, particularly you mentioned the patrolling that is going on as we speak. It's going on, it's happening now, isn't it, on the ground? And, and some really sobering accounts of some of those interactions that you outlined. Um, Lizzie, I just wonder if it's, if you, whether you have to dash or not, I know that there are things happening around you, uh, whether you have to dash or we could just do a quick couple of questions from one of our students now. We can probably squeeze in one or two, but I'm conscious that. Um, okay, we'll we'll Sorry. we'll chop it down a bit. I do I do I do um, appreciate that um, things are happening quickly around you, so we'll chop it down a bit. So I'd just like to introduce uh, one of our DMU students. Um, um, we want, as we've heard throughout all of this, we want our students to be um, part of all that we do uh, in terms of the uh, the SDGs, but also our, our link with the um, uh, with the UN. So I'd like to introduce um, Antonia Hayward. Uh, one of our students and Antonia, um, afternoon Antonia. Antonia's got a couple of questions. We'll, we'll, we'll cut it down, Lizzie, a couple of questions for, for Lizzie. So over to you, Antonia. Yes, I'll jump straight into the questions. So my first one is, what would you say to any young people who are interested in getting involved in your career path? So I'd really, really recommend it. Um, I mean, I would answer it from twofold because I know the military career isn't for everyone. I mean, I've I joined the army um, because this is the kind of thing that I wanted to work in this kind of area that I wanted to work in and I wanted to make a difference um, and I wanted to um, also go to these areas that you probably otherwise wouldn't go to because um, they're not exactly on uh, the government's um, let's go travel advice list um, but I would say if you're really keen on working in this kind of area then um, just look at where you can contribute and um, follow your heart. If it's not something that you want to do, don't give up when you, you might have ba uh, barriers or people saying that's not for you. Mm -hmm. um, so another one, is there, for your role, are there some skills that you feel you need to be successful in it? Um, so I'll talk about it as a role of a peacekeeper. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the skills that you probably need, um, firstly, patience. 
because you're working with a lot of different nationalities, a lot of people have different levels of experience, and everyone has something to contribute, but we don't all think in the same way. And now that's a good thing because it means that we think outside the box and it isn't something that uh, we don't always have group think. But it does mean that sometimes when you really feel like there's an important way forward and people aren't, um, aren't necessarily on the same side, that uh, it tests your patience. Um, so patience, um, I think enthusiasm. Sometimes we may not get the results that we want or uh, we may not have uh, the manpower or the capabilities or resources to be able to, to do everything. Um, and so I think it's important to remain enthusiastic, um, even if sometimes the outcome isn't what you wanted or isn't what was expected. Um, you still have to stay, stay positive and enthusiastic. Um, and then I guess finally linking into the point about patience, um, good teamwork and active listening, because sometimes other people have got a far better idea um, than you do. And it's important that everyone has that ch chance to speak. Thank you. Lizzie, Antonia, thank you. Lizzie, particular, particular thanks. Thanks for staying with us. I know that, that, that you're very busy. Um, and, and, and thank you for all that you and your colleagues do. And, and, um, and we wish you all well uh, and stay safe. So thank you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. I've got to start, but I hope you have a successful rest of uh, talk. Great. Thanks, Lizzie. Goodbye. Um, great to hear there from um, uh, Captain uh, Lizzie Millwater. Um, okay, uh, uh, on to our next speaker then. Uh, lots still to, to hear this afternoon. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jeff Faraday. And Jeff is um, Jeff's one of ours originally. Jeff's a DMU graduate. Um, and Jeff served as a military liaison officer with the UN mission in South Sudan soon after the civil war was declared in 2014. And He's since transferred from the military uh, into working with humanitarian organizations in the Middle East and in East Africa. Uh, Jeff has a master's in international development and humanitarian emergencies from LSE, and he graduated from DMU in 1998 uh, with a BSc in applied biology. So presumably it was a scrap talk. Nice to hear. Um, he uh, can describe, hopefully for us, an inspirational journey um, from the, the DMU campus through to working in some of the most uh, challenging environments uh, in the world to make uh, to make a difference, to make a difference globally. So uh, uh, thanks for being with us, Jeff, and, and over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, yes, I certainly have listened to some of the other speakers and I'm perhaps not quite at the same league. But anyway, uh, uh, I certainly did not expect to be in this position talking to you when I started at Scrapped Off Campus in 1995 to study applied biology. I'm not sure, I, well, I know that Scrapatoff campus doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I'm not sure if applied biology does at De Montfort either, but uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my three years at university. I did row in my first year for the university, but uh, I joined the East Midlands University Officer Training Corps and did that throughout my time. And it was really that that then sort of put me towards uh, the military career. It was either that or go to to do a master's in environmental management and as someone who perhaps wasn't the most academically minded at the time uh, I decided to go for what I saw as the easy option and went into the military so that went on from instead of being a few years went into being 16 years I did eight years or thereabouts in the British Army and then eight years in the New Zealand Army uh, throughout that time I did a number of operational tours uh, mostly peacekeeping uh, missions. Uh, so I did some with the UN, I did Cyprus and South Sudan, and then some with NATO and other multinational forces such as uh, Bosnia and uh, Timor-Leste. For me, South Sudan stands out. Uh, I was uh, went there as a military liaison officer. Uh, as was said, I sort of arrived there February 2014, shortly after the civil war started in December 2013. Uh, the I, I was posted to a place called Bor, uh, which is just north of the capital Juba. It had sort of been on the front line. Basically, Ugandan forces had moved up from the south and they held Juba and they held that area and stopped them coming down anywhere towards the capital. 
So that, and there'd been a to and fro between government and, and uh, in the in opposition forces, and many hundreds of thousands of people had been killed. Their bodies were strewn across the streets. And um, but by the time I got there, they had largely been cleared up. We still found them in the bushes, um, uh, very, you know, as we did patrols, etc., or walked around the area. Uh, but the UN had done some mass graves, etc. But my role as a military liaison officer, unarmed, uh, was to be the liaison between the uh, internally displaced persons in the protection of civilians camp, which had become attached to the UN base, which was in Bor. And there were about 5,000 Nuer there uh, who had fled when the conflict started to the UNMIS base and to the to seek protection from the UN peacekeepers. Uh, and they were alive because the UN peacekeepers had given them that protection. And around uh, South Sudan, there were a number of these large camps under the protection of peace uh, of the of the of the sort of the, the UN black, as it were, the UN peacekeepers. Um, and the issue with I, I mean, I'm so listening to I, I was traveling previously, so I didn't catch everything that everyone said. But certainly one of the things with the UN peacekeepers is they are reliant on the troop contributing nations and the level of training, the, the quality of the troops necessarily isn't always what we would want. Um, so in particular, when I was there in 2014, um, we did have the local dinka, the military. They were, they took off their uniforms, um, but they were they were military. They came in and they attacked the the camp. Uh, part of it was as much to loot and uh, to to pillage as opposed to actually kill. But in the end, um, we had about fifty seven people shot and i happened to be right in the middle of the camp at that stage um i i had worked out that something was going to go on and i put my put myself there so i could observe it not quite realizing quite how severe it was going to be um unfortunately the troops that were there to protect those civilians didn't have the training that they needed to be able to um to do what they need to do and so they they didn't fire any shots and we had a really strong mandate we had a, a chapter 7 mandate which allowed us to not only uh fire and re return fire uh, if fired upon but we could also uh preemptively engage and be able to protect actually protect civilians not just wait until the to, till the shooting starts however because of and I will say, in my opinion, because of the the train state, we they didn't do that, and uh, and they overran the camp. The fact that the the uh, IDPs fled from that part of the Unmis compound to an area where they saw that they they felt that the the peacekeeping troops would protect them. So uh, and and they were right in terms of the 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 the, the attackers didn't go beyond their their part of the. Um, of the of the base so um uh I, and, and during that my on my, myself um yeah I, I was i was held at gunpoint um i was there um i managed to negotiate myself um from being shot i was relatively lucky um and uh and then i sort of walked to an armored vehicle it was only sort of 30 meters away and inside it was filled with uh, UN peacekeepers who had just been watching out of the window um, and hadn't done anything. So, so even though I was in a uniform in a blue beret, um, it didn't give me the protection uh, uh, from from the forces that were there. So, um, that said, though, uh, I firmly believe and you know, in the in the power of the UN, the power of the peacekeepers, because mine was a snapshot of. Of some of the forces that were there. Certainly, I had colleagues elsewhere in South Sudan at the time who had, you know, they had uh, troops there that were actively engaging. They were actually actively patrolling, and they were actually active in in protecting the civilians. So it is very reliant on um, on uh, on who you have around you, um, and it certainly is something that. I think was mentioned previously, but trying to get that coordination, trying to get 198 countries to come together and agree on how their troops are going to operate um, is extremely difficult. And I used to talk to my colleagues in the military and and say, well, look, you know, look at our own forces. And I was in the New Zealand Army at the time, and we were only four and a half thousand in the army. And even then, we didn't the the infantry, the logistics, the um, artillery, trying to get them to all. Uh, um, 
work together was extremely difficult. And then, and we did it, but we did it, of course, because we, you know, we all have a common language, we have a common command structure, and we were able to practice repeatedly. And then we added the Navy and the Air Force in as well. So only with that practice, but yet we still found it very difficult. So how can we expect the UN with the, you know, 193 states, or whatever it is, um, you know, to be this seamless operation? And it can be extremely frustrating. Um, but so, I, but I am a, I am a, a, you know, I do believe in it. I do think they do a, a do good, do a good job. Um, but it is extremely difficult. So I moved across from that into the humanitarian sector. Um, I was told when I was leaving that oh, it would be really easy with your uh, with your career profile. Uh, that didn't prove to be quite the case, and I lost count of the number of applications I put in. Uh, I would say don't give up, um, but also do look after your. Um, uh, do, do make sure that for each one um, you uh, you put the effort in to get it right. I know that in sometimes I just put them out and, and didn't do it. But in the end, I was told I need to go and do a master's. So I went and did the went and got a master's at London School of Economics. And after that, I was fortunate to go to Oxfam and I went back to uh, South Sudan, uh, which was really interesting from having been a peacekeeper and been on the, on the on, if you like, so you have the UN black and you have UN blue and UN back, black is the, the peacekeepers. And so we work as humanitarians a lot with the UN blue because we're with UNHCR, UNICEF, all of the uh, you know, other those sort of uh, civilian agencies, uh, and they are one of when we engage actively with them. But we we do keep at arm's length the peacekeepers. Uh, when I was there in 2014, we were hand in glove because the the security uh, state at the time in Bor meant that they had to they lived in our base um, and and then they couldn't operate sort of or they couldn't live if you like without without the protection from us. Come 2017, when I went back there, it was a very different story. And, and I think, you know, when I look at it sort of back, I sort of think, well, when I was there, I was trying to say that we as um, as peacekeepers, we are there for the humanitarians to be able to operate. And certainly in 2014, it was because they were there because we allowed them the humanitarian space to be able to operate. Um, I think in some respects, when I went back as Oxfam, it was um, despite the UN peacekeepers in terms of we didn't um, we didn't uh, we didn't really engage very much with them. Um, and part of that is the humanitarian principles and our desire to be, uh, in particular, independent and also neutral. And in, invariably, the peacekeepers have to take a side, and that then makes it very difficult then for the engagement with the humanitarian community to sort of how do we engage? We need to engage, but also. Uh, we also don't want to be too seen to be doing embedded too close. Um, to sort of wrap up, as it were, uh, from my experience, you know, uh, certainly all the uh, all the advice you've had so far is is very um, apt. What I would say is, don't believe you're going to go and save the world. Um, do it one bite at a time, uh, one one bit at a time. Go out there. Uh, if you are going to think about joining the UN, go out and get some experience somewhere else beforehand and then come into the UN. I think they do, they quite appreciate that. Um, it, it can be an extremely rewarding career, whichever path you take, whether it be the military or um, uh, or a more the civilian aspect, um, but uh, good luck and enjoy. Jeff, thanks. Uh, thank you very much again for that insight of the experience on the ground again as a military liaison officer and, and that really evocative uh, description of the challenge, I guess, the real challenge of the, um, the protection of civilians. So, so thank you for that. I think we, we do have a, a few minutes left now. And so what I'd like to do is, is to invite the uh, rest of the panel, if they could come back on, bring them back in. And we've got, as I said, only a few minutes. So I wanted just to pick up maybe a couple of questions only that we've had through from the audience. Uh, I think it'd be nice for us to do that before we wrap up. So I'm going to go over to Antonio first uh, to pick up on one of those questions. And if we can just have, I guess, some really brief answers from, from, the, uh, from the panelists, that would be great. Thank you. Antonio. OK, so the question is, um, what are the panelists' views about the application of well the, of a well-being agenda to bring out change slash diffuse the tensions and conflicts to the road to lasting peace? So, who wants to have a crack at that first? Well-being application of a well-being agenda. Any thoughts? 
This is a question from Kamla. Uh, Julia. Yes, I, I would like to say the, the well-being agenda, the general human flourishing, that's a very interesting question, Kamala. Um, and I would say, you know, it, it's, a, it's a sort of research that we, that we do within the Centre for Law, Justice and Society. And it's the, it's the kind of research that our doctoral students are engaged in as well, sort of, you know, applying alternative lenses and alternative conceptions to, to widen out the scope of peacekeeping, looking at well-being, even in terms of health and food security, you know, food security um, often leads to conflict situations where people move north and then there's, you know, ensuing stability. So, um, yeah, I, I suppose it's more of an academic question. It's not an on the ground question that, um, you know, maybe sign up for one of our PhD uh, <laughs> study courses. But no, it's a good question and very, very valid. Thank you. Thanks, Antonia. Um, I think we've got time for just one other question, unless there was anything else on that one. Anybody else want to contribute on that one? Yeah, Fallon. So, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to have a quick, a quick uh, crack at that on well-being, um, uh, and I and I hope I've I've got the sense of the question right. Um, but but for me, it raises one of the very important points in in peacekeeping and peace building, which is addressing underlying drivers of conflict, uh, which often have to do with. Um, economic development uh, and inclusion and, and job opportunities that obviously affect people's well-being and the well-being of their families. Um, and I think this is one of the one of the particular reasons why young people are very important in establishing peace, um, because not only do they have um, a role to play in peace building, but they have a big role in economic development uh, and kind of sowing the seeds um, for uh, for reconciliation in the long term. And if we if you don't get that right and young people are marginalized and dispossessed then it can be very difficult to keep um countries on an upwards trajectory um so i i I, th I think it is very important to have a kind of uh, not merely a security approach to these issues but a kind of whole of person whole of society approach um a well-being economic and social well-being a very important part of that thanks fellow it is an important point actually that's determinants of security i guess in the end isn't it thank you um, I think we've got time for another question. If we can get the question, if we can bring the question up on screen. Um, I have it in the chat, I think. <laughs> it's a nice small question, I guess, um, from, from Lee. Um, and again, if we can try and keep this fairly brief, I'm sure that people will have thoughts on this. Optimism about world peace in the future, the direction of travel, how things are going. Um, do, would anybody on the panel like to pick that up in terms of their feelings around the um, uh, around whether th there is optimism there or, or otherwise. Yeah, Oliver. Yes, I mean, quite an uh, open-ended question. <laughs> I mean, what's my perspective? I spent much of 25 years in the military in one conflict zone or another. And on the face of it, one would say, you know, world peace is, uh, is something we aspire to, but we never yet sort of seem to achieve. I think one has to understand that conflict tension to some form or other will will always exist between nation states um, and arguably for those of you tuning in um, you know your uh, lifetimes are, are going to see uh, similar levels of conflict which may be in different ways to those that um, I have seen and my parents and my grandparents before you know, the nature of conflict is, is changing, but the way in which, um, you know, it happens on the ground, what we're fighting over, you know, it's going to be very different to, to what we saw in the Second World War. It's going to take place in very different environments. You've seen what happened uh, over the last few years in Syria, for example. But what are the challenges over the horizon? What are the contested areas? Is it going to be to do with the climate, for example? Is it going to be challenges about water? Uh, or is it going to remain sort of traditional state on state action over sort of trying to get power? So I, I think it's probably something for you to debate. Uh, but what I would, 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 would ask you to do is to, 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 to look out there and look at, see what are the challenges facing uh, developing countries where there are a lot of well-established, developed countries who hold resources, perhaps need more resources, 
and how they're exploiting countries that are only developing but need money uh, or need uh, the support of, of, of other more developed nations. Um, so I think that they're going to be um, conflicts uh, for, for many years to come. Uh, what we just hope is that by discussing this and being able to have this sort of parliament that we have in the United Nations, that we get to a situation where we can still talk about it rather than uh, go through the process of, of another war. After all, that is why the United Nations uh, was formed, uh, not to repeat something like the Second World War. Over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Oliver. Um, we, we have just got a minute or so if there are any further comments around the optimism for, for, for you know, the direction of travel and world peace at the moment. Any, uh, Richard? Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's just a, a quick comment really following on from uh, what Colonel Nurton said. I think certainly at the, now we've gotten to the point where lots of nation states have such a powerful weaponry that they almost don't want to use it. It's, it's a bit like the, the nuclear standoff. And I think actually what we'll see is a greater increase in activity in, in the cyber domain with the different states. It's almost certainly happening as we speak. And I think that's that's going to increase. But in many ways, actually, it's far better in the cyber domain because at the moment, the impact is still limited in terms of um, physical harm to citizens. So that area will, will probably increase, much like the Cold War, trying to outdo the other side. Um, so in some ways, it will get better. In, in some ways, it might well get a little bit worse. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Jeff? From you. Yeah, just very quickly, sort of from a humanitarian perspective, I don't think um, I don't think I'm not expecting world peace certainly in my lifetime. Um, I, I think what I where I would be optimistic though is that we will see peace in certain areas that we see conflict now, and I think you know as if we can push forward with that, and you know as I say, I don't think uh, I finished off with saying you know, we're not going to save the world. Um, if we can find an area that we are successful in, and we can move there and, and get peace in that part um, but also don't expect that what works in one place will work in another and uh, having worked in East Africa I'm, I'm currently in East Africa I've worked in the Middle East before um, it's got to come from within so they have got to find their own solutions for peace and it's we can help them along the way but at the end of the day no one wants someone coming into their own home and telling them how to uh, make a cup of tea um, so we we need to move and grow their capacity for world peace and i think you know peace is it, it is possible thank you jeff um and we're, we're out of time now but i think that's a nice place to finish actually and those those sentiments are a nice place to finish um we, we've we've heard a really diverse and eclectic uh, um collection of experiences this afternoon and it's been fantastic to sit and listen to and, and actually humbling to sit and listen to as well um and and uh, you know part of it is a call to action for us i guess uh, to get involved um and, and i was thinking throughout all of this we, we've been talking about peacekeeping and in all its various forms and it's such a such an emotive word peacekeeper to be a peacekeeper in in that very basic sense is a very very emotive word for us to think of um so uh, any any staff or students who want to engage with our strategic development goal hub or with our sdg 16 research or teaching uh, links to the UN, uh, please do get in touch and you can you can email us at dmusdg16 at uh, dmu.ac.uk and, and all that remains is for me to thank all our speakers uh, this afternoon. Uh, again, it has been, it's been fascinating and, and I'd like to thank everybody for giving up their time to talk about their experiences uh, to us. So thanks to, to Julia, to Oliver, Phelan, Jeff, Richard, Antonia, uh, Lizzie, uh, thanks to Laura and to Jamie, who are working behind the scenes to make this happen. Uh, and thanks to uh, Mark Charlton, uh, who's put a lot of this together and organized it. And, and, and actually, Mark did ask me to pass on his thanks to the panel. I know Mark's the one who's been in contact with you all to organize this. So Mark did ask me to pass on his thanks. So um, I wanted to make sure I did so. Um, thank you all very much. And, um, uh, uh, and uh, we hope to engage with you and see you again at something similar in the future. Who knows? 
Thank you very much. Thank you to all. Thank you.